Hi, my name is Anwar. I'm a consultant at Design Lab. Welcome to Flash Talks. In this video, we'll learn what a Flash Talk is, we'll watch and critique some examples of Flash Talks, and we'll learn how to set timings to our slides in PowerPoint so they automatically advance to the next slide after a specific amount of time. So what is a Flash Talk? A Flash Talk is a very short presentation that only lasts for a few minutes. The goal of Flash Talks is to articulate a topic in a quick, insightful, and clear manner. Because Flash Talks are so brief, the presenter needs to get rid of any non-essential information in their presentation. The Flash Talk format allows for many presenters in a short period of time, so audiences can learn a little bit about multiple topics. That's one of the reasons Flash Talks are so popular at large conferences. The format of Flash Talks varies. Some Flash Talks give speakers only three minutes and a single slide to make a compelling presentation. Other formats, like Ignite and Pecha Kucha, involve a specific number of slides that automatically advance at fixed intervals. The Pecha Kucha style Flash Talk, for example, is 20 slides long. Each slide plays for exactly 20 seconds. So that's a grand total of 400 seconds or six minutes and 40 seconds for your presentation. Now let's take a look at a Pecha Kucha example. Okay, here we go. We're gonna talk about hand washing. This is Brian from Pecha Kucha, uh, proving that uh, in times of crises, there's still a chance to learn and be creative. So washing your hands, this is the best way you can stay healthy in this coronavirus time. And uh, we're going to talk about washing your hands in this Pecha Kucha presentation. Let's see how many of these I can get off. Interesting facts about hand washing. 80% of diseases are transmitted by touch. The average keyboard contains more bacteria than a toilet seat. An average person's hands carry at least 3,000 different kinds of bacteria. 26,000 different kinds of bacteria live on banknotes. Gross. It's all over the place. Oh, women wash their hands more than men. This guy is Ig Ignaz Philip. Sim is Semmelweis. He was the dude who was the champion of uh, hand washing. He was a surgeon. He was, of, uh, he was an obstetrician who delivered babies, and he kind of wondered why <coughs> uh, some of his colleagues were dying. Uh, and, and he noticed that they were dying in similar ways that women who gave childbirth would die. They they experienced the same symptoms, and uh, which was this wretched, awful. Uh, things you don't want to hear you don't want to know about but they were they died the same way and he put two and two together that uh, you got to wash your hands before you catch a baby so that's why these doctors all uh, wash their hands and it's interesting I was thinking about this you know the doctors clothes are called scrubs I think so it's like this is how important um, hand washing is and those sponges that the doctor that the surgeons use aren't those so awesome so uh, when I was uh, back in my cafe days, I remember the, the health department came to our restaurant and they, they did this thing where they put, they dumped this stuff all over our hands and they tried to like, uh, you know, gave us, told us to go wash them off and then they put them under this uh, black light and tried to figure out how many, uh, how, how well they were washed. And, you know, to everybody's amazement, despite washing them really hard, they were like, um, you know, they were still really dirty. And this, all this black light stuff proved that uh, there was still all this bacteria. And so <clears throat> uh, they kind of told us, you know, you got to you got to spend you got to basically wash your hands the length of the, the, the alphabet song is, you know, the A, B, C, D. And, and you got to get between all the fingers and all the thumbs. And, you know, this and these are the parts that are of your hands that are often missed when washing your hands so pay attention sp pay special attention to these <clears throat> to these parts and uh, I've been seeing this uh, these fun uh, you can sing along while you're washing your hands this is the Bohemian Rhapsody version for the first part it's is this the real life is this just fantasy caught in a landslide and until you get to the part where it, nothing really matters you know you've you've washed your hands enough <clears throat> and you know, washing your hands is actually kind of a, a, a wonderfully whimsical, fun uh, kind of thing. And, and bubbles and bars of soap and slippery uh, 
this and that is kind of fun to, uh, it's actually a fun thing to wash. And I was thinking about this because it's so hard to get my kids to wash their hands. And um, I'm thinking of maybe imaginative ways to, uh, to, make, to make hand washing fun. And so uh, I did the, um, I did the, you know, taught my kids that they should wash their hands for the length of the alphabet song like I was taught. But I found on the internet this great product it's called Kami Shibai, which is um, is a Japanese game where one word, uh, the last letter of the the last letter of the word is the first letter of the next word. So they built this game where the more you wash your hands, you can. There's a game inside the bar of soap where the, after you wash one layer, another uh, picture is revealed. That's part of this Kami Shibai game. Another fun thing you could do is you could get imaginative, like this restaurant owner did, that says, you know, you use a Scrabble board to say employees must wash their hands before returning to work and he's got it in, in Spanish here, here too la vez la, la, let's see la vez well I missed it anyway and uh, hand sanitizer you used to have this like automatic hand sanitizer hand you know soap dispenser thing the like you know uh, what do they call that uh, radio not radio but uh, but the thing comes out automatically now you can get these at your house we have one of these at our house so you don't even have to touch anything for the soap thing to come out and uh, another way to get creative with washing your hands is to uh, to make your own hand sanitizer. Apparently, uh, in the hand sanitizer shortage of 2020, now uh, people are getting imaginative with uh, making their own hand sanitizer recipes. So let's figure out how to do that. I think you can get online and figure out all the stuff that you need to make your own hand sanitizer at home. And it's, it looks like a science experiment. As a as a photographer who likes to play around in the dark room. I, uh, I can tell you that um, mixing chemicals and funnels and cylinders and measuring cups this is all quite fun. So maybe you can get a kick out of it too. And uh, I thought this was a brilliant idea. Come in and wash your hands for free. This, this uh, signage on the side of some building. What a great way to get people to come inside your shop. Uh, you know, to get them to, you know, how good does it feel to like just wash your hands when in the middle of, you know, when you're and you're not really expecting to, and what a great way to get custom, put new potential customers in your in your in your store. And this guy, uh, his name is Joe Smith. He's a champion of uh, paper towels. I mean, uh, drying your hands with an air dryer is really good. Using uh, towels that get reused over and over again, not so good. But paper towels, we tend to pull a lot of them out. And this guy proves that you can just you only need one paper towel. Look out for him online. <clears throat> And something else that I came across while I was looking up this Petri Picture presentation was this beautiful uh, word cloud that, uh, look at all these words that are associated with uh, hand washing. You didn't even, uh, you didn't even imagine. Lather, what a great word, lather. And basin, and anyway. So there you go, there's a, there's a Petri Picture presentation in about uh, 20 slides, 20 seconds each about how to wash your hands. And uh, to close it out, here's a nice little uh, cross stitching threading old lady thing wash your hands and don't be a racist okay thanks there are a number of ways this flash talk could be improved is the concept clear the subject is hand washing but the presentation meanders quite a bit the information could be organized differently to help the audience better follow the narrative and understand the speaker's main point Aesthetically, the slides could use some repetition, making them feel more cohesive. The images could be cropped to be more similar, and some of the images were too cluttered and had too much text, making it difficult to see what's important. Looking at the technical side of things, some of the images were pixelated. Higher resolution images would be better. The presenter's timing is off. Every 20 seconds, the slides advance but the speaker is often still talking about the previous slide. So the images and what the presenter is saying often don't match. Now let's take a look at another Pecha Kucha example. Hi, my name's Emily. There we go, I wear a lot of hats. There, there, there they are. Um, I'm an author, an illustrator, a mom. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Read and Write Kalamazoo. We're a literacy nonprofit that does creative writing workshops with youth um, pre-K through high school. Uh, I wanted to start, though, by defining creative vision. It's where I live as a creative and what we 
bring to the table with the youth that we serve. So creative vision starts with what you observe, what you see. Anybody who's creative, a dreamer, a doer, a maker, it starts here with what you see. And we ask this with our students all the time. Don't just tell me that they walked in the room. How did they walk the into the room? How did they pick up the cup of coffee? And then it goes to what's not there. So if you're creative, you're really thinking also, about those blank spaces, right? You're thinking about what's missing, where are the gaps? And then that leads to the possibility of what really could be there. And so then when those two things, I love a Venn diagram, are fusing together, <laughs> that's the world of the creative space. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with what that is. And in that creative space, that's where action lives. That's where empathy building lives. That's where we make and we do and we create change and we find ourselves. Um, so we're going to take a time machine back to December 2011. My friend Anne and I were talking about um, being writers and wanting to write with youth. And we were just talking. I was a teacher for a handful of years and was an editor and had experience in publication. So we were sitting kind of kind of near that purple space, and we heard this quote, if there's a book that you want to read but has yet to be written, you must be the one to write it. So it's kind of this empowering you know, sentiment that really shoved us back into that purple zone, that, that cross-section of what we're observing or feeling and filling these gaps. So I'm going to go back to this because... That's really what it was all about, like wanting to be active and to make change and live in this purple cross section. And really it's the marriage of living outside of ourselves and processing the information that shapes our lives. So that is a little baby pencil. Uh, so Rita Wright Kalamazoo was born. So we... <laughs> So yes, there we are. Uh, we started small with two summer writing workshops, and now we're in a home of our own. We have a writing center. We have a really fun storefront that helps support the free programs. And we exist to celebrate and amplify youth voices. So this passion about creative vision, um, really we're sharing with the youth that we serve um, our mission is to support the growth and the learning of youth through the cultivation of reading and writing skills. And we work with youth all the time, and we're like, why do we write? And that's a good question. We want to flip the script and not make it something that is an assignment, but something that we are moved to do because we see the world, we've got questions, and we're ready to fill those gaps and be active in being creative and amplifying voices. <clears throat> So th these are the kind of things that we do. We publish student work. We give them a platform to be heard in the community. We have readers' rooms. We work with schools. We have summer camps. We make magazines and zines. And we have zines like how to take care of your pet rock. And so there's many ways that we encourage them to express that voice. And so really the puzzle piece, that creative vision turned into creative voice is a solitary thing sometimes, right? You're internalizing this and you're learning how to grow and not only with what I do and with what I do with youth, I think it's all of us. And so uh, it's just a piece of the puzzle. And so learning how that looks in the community with your voice and your art and your, your passion, it's about, and that's what we do with our youth. We're like, how can we, what, 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 we, what we do relies on an invested community, right? We're invested, the success of every student. So really I wanna share a specific story. We give a lot of writing prompts with our youth. One in particular was pretty amazing. If you could invent anything to help in your life, what would it be? It's a great question. We, we ask, Kids of all ages, we work with preschoolers. They have really fun things that they'd invent. High schoolers are gonna invite some other stuff. Third graders, you get a lot of homework bots. <laughs> you get a lot of like food o like Star Trek-esque machines that are gonna give you donuts whenever you want. And you get like magic closets and whatnot. So it's really fun and inspiring and we're talking about what we see and what we need. And we had one student who created an encouragement robot really great. We're like, oh, an encouragement robot. That's great. Um, and really, it was about marrying those two things, what he saw in his life, what he observed, and then what was missing, right? So he's writing the story about this encouragement robot. And we're like, 
tell us more. So this encouragement robot would follow him around and say encouraging things because he didn't feel like he had that in his life. So we gave him this platform, right, to see, to, well, to give a voice to what he saw in his life and then to think about how to fill that gap. And he's like, everyone needs this, right? Like, we all need to hear great things. We need to hear this encouragement. And so he's like, I actually should make this for everybody. And we're like, yeah, do it. And that's what it's all about. That's what being creative, using your voice and being heard. He was heard, he was seen, he shared his story built relationships with the volunteers and our staff. And so really, I want you to know about what we do at Rock. And we have this great storefront now called the Geological and Musicological Survey Company. And it's a mouthful on purpose. We incite curiosity from the door front. You walk in, it's exciting. Lots of questions all the time. And it's really a portal to what we do in the way that we serve students in our writing center. So I hope, my hope for all of you, is that we live in the purple zone, right? That creative space, and that you're always observing and seeing what's there, and you're trying to fill the gaps. Conceptually, this example is stronger than the first. This presentation clearly informs the audience about the nonprofit organization, what they do, who they serve, how they are successful, and give some examples. Aesthetically, the slides look cohesive and have a consistent style. The same color palette and font are used in nearly every slide, and the couple slides that didn't match exactly still had a similar look. Finally, all of the images were clear and easy to see. Technically, the presentation was well organized. The presenter is well rehearsed, and you can hear the presenter's passion and personality. She's clearly invested in the topic she's presenting on. Now, let's take a look at Microsoft PowerPoint. I'm going to show you how to set your slide timings to automatically advance at a regular interval. Here's a presentation I made called 10 Colors in 30 Seconds. There are 10 slides. I want each of them to automatically play for three seconds before advancing to the next slide. How do I do that? First, I like to make sure the first slide is selected. Then, I click the Transitions tab. On the left-hand side, I select None. Many of the animated transitions can be distracting and not look very professional. Over on the top right, I set duration to zero. Point zero 0.01 will appear, and that's okay. Next, I set the sound dial to no sound. Similar to transitions, sounds can be distracting and unprofessional. On mouse click should not be selected, so click the check mark to remove it. Make sure there's a check mark in the box next to after. I want my slides to play for three seconds each, so I enter three. Finally, I click apply to all. Now, Select the Slideshow tab. In the menu, click Play from Start. The slides automatically advance every three seconds. And that's how you set your PowerPoint slides to advance at a regular interval. Be sure to visit the Design Lab website, where you can make an appointment with a Design Lab consultant. And while you're there, be sure to check out our resources page, which has helpful links for presentations and all of your digital media projects. Thanks for watching.